for the Young Greens and welcome to our hustings for the next Green representative in the House of Lords. Really loud lorries just come past my window, sorry if that was loud for everyone. Um, <laughs> it's so great to see you all here. Um, I know there's been a lot of hustings, I really appreciate your engaging in this process so much because it is really important. Um, throughout lockdown, we as the Young Greens have been running lots of events online um, from training on campaigns, communications, uh, some political education from some incredible speakers, both within and outside the Green Party. Um, and now we've been bringing you hustings for various different positions for um, the leadership in the Green Party. And this is the first time we've had our very own Young Greens hustings uh, this year for this election. So it's really excited and really appreciate um, you guys coming here, candidates on the call. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and I will hand over to Tom in a minute um, to start our hustings. First, I'm going to let you know uh, a couple of things we've got coming up soon. Uh, so I said at the beginning that I am the events officer for the Young Greens. And I'm actually only the events officer for another couple of weeks um, because we will be electing a new committee to lead the Young Greens over the next year very soon. And I'm very sad to leave, but we have some really, really um, exciting people standing. And at 1 p.m. tomorrow, uh, you can hear from them. So we will have more hustings uh, for the uh, Young Greens Executive Committee, Structures and Procedures Committee, and the Green Students Committee. And I'm really impressed that I remembered all that. Um, and I popped a link in there to uh, sign up for those hustings, and I will do so again at the end. Uh, so now all it leaves me to is to hand over to Tom, who will introduce our hustings and how it's going to work. So thanks, Tom. Well, thank you very much, Katrina. Uh, so uh, for those of you who haven't been on the last two hustings uh, and who aren't still bored of my voice, uh, my name is Tom Hazel. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Young Greens, uh, and I'll be chairing tonight's hustings. Uh, so just before we start, I'll run through the rules uh, and tell you how to ask your questions too. Uh, so first rule is for you, um, as viewers, please keep yourself muted uh, throughout the hustings. So my new sidekick, uh, who's Matthew, uh, he's probably waving now, won't have to kick you out. Uh, and secondly, uh, the way it will work tonight won't be too different um, to all the hustings you've been to so far, and will be absolutely not different at all uh, to all the Young Greens hustings that we've had so far in the past couple of weeks. Uh, so we're going to start off with each of the candidates giving a four minute introductory speech and telling you why they think Young Greens should vote for them. Uh, unfortunately, we're not joined tonight by Rupert Reid, who couldn't make it, so we'll be sharing his campaign video as well. Uh, and then we'll go straight on to questions. Uh, we've got some pre-submitted questions that you might have uh, popped in the box when you filled in the form. Uh, but if there's any more questions you'd like to ask, uh, send a private Zoom message to Rosie and she'll pass them on to me. Uh, and we're actually going to try and finish on time tonight um, at 9.30, just with some short final appeals from the candidates. Uh, so with that being said, uh, we'll move straight on to the candidates' introductory speeches uh, and we're going to go in reverse surname order for this one, uh, which is a bit wild. Uh, so that order will be Amelia um, and then Andrew and then Molly. Uh, so over to you, Amelia, for your four minute introductory speech, please. Thank you so much and thank you so much for being here as well. I'm Amelia Womack and after you've put your faith in me for three terms as deputy leader, I'm asking you to put your faith in me for the House of Lords. I believe that politics at its best is when hope delivers change and that's what you'll get from me in the House of Lords. I'm a scientist with the qualifications to back it up, an MSc in environmental technology and a BSc in environmental biology, and I've worked in the sustainability sector. And I want to ensure that all policy is scrutinized from a scientific perspective, while we push for a Green New Deal that ensures that we tackle inequality while staying below 1.5 degrees of warming and tackling the ecological emergency. I want to represent diversity of voice, but also diversity of age and gender. 26% of the House of Lords are women. Only 5% are below the age of 50. It's clear that we need to ensure that people who so often don't get a seat at the table need to be heard. We've seen a seismic shift in representation of young women around the world, putting forward radical yet rational ideas that are changing the face of global politics. I've been shortlisted as One World Young Politician of the Year for my work, which, has now been re which was recognised on an international basis. I have extensive me media experience, having taken on Andrew Neil and Piers Morgan, have been on every major news channel, have had articles, quotes and comment pieces in The Guardian, The Independent, The New Statesman, Vogue and Grazia, to name but a few. I've even had my own weekly column during the 2019 general election. I have worked to make change happen. I've already sit in parliamentary committees. 
I have already changed legislation by working cross party uh, with a number of different people to ensure that we're tackling issues around women's rights and the environment. I've also worked to influence the national de debate, having co-founded Another Europe is Possible, the only left-wing Remain campaign, and being co-chair of the People's Assembly, making sure that our influence in politics is about changing a national agenda, as well as getting our voices voice heard in other ways. I know as Greens, we will only accept someone in the House of Lords that will disrupt the cosy consensus of stuffy chambers. That's what you'll get for me, with me if you vote for me, Amelia Womack, first preference. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Amelia, for that introductory speech. Uh, so without further ado, we'll move on to Andrew for your four minute introductory speech, please. Uh, hello. Um, I joined the Green Party when I was 24, so uh, I was a young Green. Um, I'm a councillor. Uh, I was first elected 21 years ago uh, when I was 34 to Kirklees Council in Yorkshire. Elected and re-elected six times to the News and Ward, where we've won every local election since 1996. That's a record 18 local election wins on the trot. I've been Green Party energy spokesperson for a few years now, and I've done many press, TV and radio interviews speaking on renewable energy, insulation standards and the folly of fossil fuels. I'm a local government association peer mentor for all green councillors, providing help and support to our 300 plus councillors, um, many of whom are quite new and so need quite a bit of help. Um, I've been a member of several local government association policy boards and through that I've given direct policy input to government ministers. I've also provided evidence to parliamentary select committees of MPs on the need for more funding, more funding for flood defences. I was a member of the EU Committee of the Regions for the last five years and through that an EU delegate to four of the most recent UN climate talks. So why the House of Lords? It would send a very strong statement for the Green Party to send an elected politician to the unelected House of Lords. I represent a constituency. I can speak with authority and authenticity about the impact of government policies on local people, just like an MP can. And I would vote to abolish the House of Lords. So what would I bring to Parliament? I'm one of the few Green politicians who's actually initiated and implemented Green Party policies. I successfully proposed the UK's first university free insulation scheme in Kirklees, where over 50,000 homes were insulated and the Kirklees Warm Zone scheme won national awards and recognition. I proposed a policy effectively banning fracking in our council area by establishing that any planning application for fracking would have to demonstrate how it would have net zero impact on climate change. This approved policy set a precedent for all councils around the country. I've influenced global policy by getting a stronger focus on local climate action at the UN climate talks by forging alliances with local and regional governments internationally. So this feels like the right time for me. I've gained valuable experience being elected politician for 20 plus years. I think it gives me more legitimacy in a chamber with a very dubious legitimacy. I also like having a strong link with all the many diverse communities that I represent. It keeps my feet on the ground and, and all politicians need that. I know Jenny and Natalie well, having worked with them for many years, so I know we would make a great team. Obviously, we're different, have different strengths, have different backgrounds, different skills, but that's what makes for good teams. My priorities, addressing climate change is a strong focus for me. Uh, I've had some real success at getting innovative policies adopted, and that means being aware to opportunities, negotiating with other parties, and getting legislation passed. I'd also like to see an end to the right to buy council houses because we desperately need more social housing for those on the very lowest incomes. And we need to build thousands of new low energy demand passive, house ca passive houses. For young Greens, you'll see uh, more of the impacts of climate change than I will. Uh, and my passionate aim is to help ensure you um, not just have a future, but it's a good future. I would want to establish a Young Greens and Student Contact Group to help draw up my work programme for each year. My record has shown that I can get things done in whichever institution I've worked in. So please support me. Andrew Cooper is your first choice on the House of Lords ordered list. Perfect. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, so for the last person we've got tonight, we'll go over to Molly for your four minute introductory speech, please. Thank you very much, Tom. And thanks to everybody for, for being here tonight. Um, so I'm standing here on my record. Hopefully some of you saw the work I did as a member of the European Parliament. And one of the things I was proud of achieving was spotting political opportunities 
even when the agenda wasn't necessarily friendly to the sorts of issues that we're really concerned about, and managing to push our policies in terms of actually changing laws, but also in terms of the public debate. And I'm the only candidate here who's actually got legislative experience. And obviously that matters because the House of Lords is a legislative chamber. I mean, astonishingly and outrageously, it's half of the, the parliament that makes our laws. But I do think it's important to understand how to make law and it would enable me to be effective and also have to, the respect of other peers. I'm also good at um, learning detailed policy. I'm a bit of a nerd in that way. And I found that did come in very helpful when I was an MEP, but also it's more important in the House of Lords because you don't have staff and so you have to do all the kind of research work yourself. And as a, as a professor of economics, famously, I would like to be able to expand our work in that area and really start to really build credibility for our fantastic economic policies in, in Parliament. I'm not going to patronise you as young Greens by suggesting that you're only interested in some issues because I know that you're interested in all the issues that I'm interested in as well. But I do think it's important to listen to young people and to take the issues that you're most passionate about forward, while also encouraging you to maybe expand your horizons and convince you how absolutely thrilling something like land value tax is. So I would see that as a kind of a two way street and a dialogue. I'm also just furious about lots of things, as we saw in the chat before this started. But one of the things that really drives me crazy is intergenerational inequity. I think it's completely outrageous that older people are holding all the assets and just depriving younger people of a chance in life, whether that's about decent conditions at work or a flat or whatever. And obviously I see this with my own children. And so two of the issues I work on particularly are um, housing equity and making sure that everybody has the right to, to a safe home and improved rights for renters and also um, getting rid of student debt. And I've written about that and campaigned about that. And I just would, you know, I'd be very focused on that issue. I've worked a lot with young people in the South West when I was representing a lot of them in, in Brussels and especially on uh, the Green New Deal where I had a, a young person and a trade unionist actually on each of the panels I organised around the region and I've been so impressed by Fridays for the Future and you know just their insights into what we need to do to change the economy particularly and I think we could take that forward in terms of setting up a youth climate parliament and it's something you could do from the House of Lords. And I think it'd be quite dynamic and interesting to do that from the sort of Crumbly's house, as it were, you know, bring young people in on that platform. There's nothing to stop us doing that. So um, obviously I'm not young anymore like Andy. I was young once, but I'm now 57. And um, I do notice that as you get older, it's harder to change your mind about things. And issues have come at me that I've found it quite hard to get my head around sometimes. But I've really found that talking to younger people, whether it's my own children or the young people that I teach in university has helped move me forward. And I, I'm going to say I'm pretty good at being able to, um, yeah, to just change. And I can tell you this gets hard as you get older to change your mind as issues change. And I think particularly on globalization and also on trans issues, I have changed my position as a result of talking to young people. So I, I would benefit from, from talking to you and I hope you'd also find me a, a good representative in the House of Lords. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Molly. Uh, so now we're going to move on and attempt to watch uh, Rupert Reid's campaign video. Uh, we tried it out uh, before before the hosting started and it kind of worked then. Uh, so I'm hoping it's going to kind of work now. Uh, so uh, here we go. So I want to start out by addressing the younger people in the room, which is the majority of you younger than me. Your leaders have failed you. Your governments have failed you. Your parents and their generation have failed you. Your teachers have failed you. And I failed you. failed you. There's something vaguely obscene about saying a human life is worth this, this much money or a beautiful view is worth that much money. We really need to get out of that kind of mindset of thinking only in terms of money and thinking in terms of what's really, really important, the things that make our lives worth living. We can vote green in the election and we can actually get the right policies in which are actually seriously aligned with what we now need. And the root cause of the problem is the academy system itself. This absurd system created, let's not forget, by a Labour government, continued by the current government, that enables rich people to buy 
access to the state education system. We in the Greens think that's completely well, wrong. The overwhelming majority of air travel is undertaken by the super rich. And if we carry on having more and more air travel, there's no future. Game over. So the question I'd like to put to over to our Labour and Conservative MPs is, will you agree to stop making things worse? Will you agree right now to stop airport expansion, to cancel HS2, to stop building new roads, and to stop prospecting for new fossil fuels? Leaders say, Patrick, why did your leader say the other day that people have a right to be concerned if Romanians move in next door to them? What Mr Farage said the other day was plainly xenophobic. No travel at all, that kind no, of thing. It's not no air travel at all. Don't put words in our mouths. It would be a significant reduction in air travel. Yeah. My message to you tonight is forget about 2050. Forget about rising sea levels. Forget about polar bears and penguins, precious and beautiful though they are. This is about us now. And then I started to see what he did, which I think was quite spectacular, actually, facing down some absolutely appalling treatment by the media during the rebellion. You and your like are a stain upon the city. Uh, causing the chaos outside this building here and is wrong. Not on the, not, not on the bridge this morning. Excuse me. I think, Sling yeah, your hook. Any... You held the space in a dignified and informed way, which put them to shame, actually, I have to say. <laughs> The rebellion is not about blaming individuals for what they do. It's about us all working together to turn this around. Only because these radical means have been taken that we're actually having this conversation at all. And everyone knows that we have right on our side on this issue. Pretty much everyone. Climate change denial, that's yesterday's news. This is about the fact that last summer, the crops in this country were failing as they were baked in the fields. After our rebellion in April, Parliament declared a climate and environment emergency. But what's actually been done? This is about the intense vulnerability of our whole society to this catastrophe that is already descending on us. This is the issue on which our children will judge us. And if we don't get it right, we will be judged. These are the people that I'm doing this for. Poppy and Rosie. Poppy and Rosie, yeah. Because I love them. Well, that appeared to work. Uh, so uh, that is uh, the end of our introductory speeches there. Let me just get my uh, script back up and we're going to move straight on to the questions tonight uh, in the same way that we've done in all the other hustings so far. Uh, I'll make sure to repeat these each time and put them in the chat too. Um, and as with last time and the time before, we won't stick a hard, question, uh, hard limit on the answer lengths. Um, but I've asked the uh, candidates before to keep them somewhere around the three minute mark. Um, and I'll start biting in if they're much longer than that. But it's a hot night. Uh, I'm quite tired. We won't worry too much about them. Uh, so the order we'll answer the first question in uh, will be uh, Andrew Cooper, then Molly, then Amelia. Um, and we're going to dive straight in here. This was a pre-submitted question. Uh, so Andrew, uh, what would you push for in order to get the UK to address its barbaric colonial history, uh, particularly in education? Uh, so, so yes, um, I, I think we need to change the curriculum uh, to actually ensure that uh, we, we fully um, explain what our role has been in, uh, in globalization over and uh, our imper imperial past uh, and what that meant uh, and the subjugation uh, of, uh, of many people around the world, many of whom now uh, are the uh, people who live in, in this country, their, their ancestors. Um, were people we uh, we subjugated in the colonies uh, as they were so that has got to be understood and we've got to uh, stand up for that uh, but also the, the the life that we have built here in this country the the life that we live is built on the backs of those those countries is built on the backs of those people uh, and so um, in many ways we've got to recognize that and recognize that we owe reparations uh, in so many ways to those places and there are people around, uh, around and about, and we know the characters concerned, who, um, who talk about all the people who are immigrants who come to this country. It's what we've done to their countries that they've come from uh, that's actually um, uh, one of the reasons that they try and come here for, for a better life. Uh, and it, one of the things we need to look for is global equity. We, need to, we have, a, we have a, a global responsibility uh, to uh, help create a more equal world so it's uh, we shouldn't be just thinking of ourselves and thinking of the of the uh, the uk but actually looking at what we can do to play a much greater role in the development of um, of of other countries uh, and that means i think looking at uh, the uk development budget and seeing what the money is actually spent on because uh, uk aid 
um, is uh, bears, a, bears a, a, a great degree of examination to look at how much uh, money we send and what it's actually used for because the purpose of aid in the UK is often uh, about um, about gaining advantage for UK businesses and that's not what I think aid should be for. It should be about looking at what best helps uh, the countries that, that uh, the money goes to and not necessarily the, uh, the corrupt dictators who often live in those countries. So education, reparation, uh, those are two things that we, uh, we really need to focus on. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your answer to that question, um, Andrew. So we're going to go over to you now, Molly. Uh, so what would you push for in order to get the UK to address its barbaric colonial history uh, and particularly in education? Over to you, Molly. Well, one of the things that made me really, um, it's really shocked me, actually, during this whole um, Black Lives Matter time and, you know, when, as that's become at the centre of our minds, is just reflecting on my own education because I grew up and went to school in Bath and it was just 12 miles away from Bristol. So there was a fantastic educational opportunity there in terms of the slave trade, which actually started out of Bristol. And the trafficking in enslaved Africans was actually invented in Bristol, 12 miles where, where, away from where I went to school. But we had nothing, zero. I heard nothing about it in school at all. Um, and I just think it's shocking and it's not much better. It wasn't much better for my children when they went through school. And so, I think the first thing we all have to do is to address our own ignorance and actually during this period of, of lockdown I've had a lot of opportunity to do that and I've had a really interesting time reading my way around the various reading lists that have been made available and a bit like I was saying earlier you know when you change your mind and when you learn and expand it's kind of exhilarating but a bit disturbing at the same time and we're all going to have to go through that process some people aren't as um, open to that as others but there's a lot of campaign groups out there like Black Curriculum, which I think comes from Bristol and other other people from the black community and descendants of enslaved Africans who are already um, developing these curriculum and, and working towards making them a part of the national curriculum as they should obviously be. I think the, the really weird thing here is that, that we stump somehow still defining whiteness is the norm and everything else is not the norm and i'm really getting to, to object to the, this idea of bane you know like you can just define all these other groups that aren't white and that's somehow an acceptable thing to do and it's just a really symbolic of what's gone wrong i think in us not thinking about our own history we're still putting white people at the center and that's got to change um obviously I've, I've done a lot of work with clio in bristol and thought a lot about stuff through in that context and one of the things we discussed is we don't want to have a slavery museum, we want to have a museum of black British history. And they have such a thing in the Smithsonian, and that's one of the things that, that she's campaigning for through the council there. So I, I've worked uh, with Cleo in Bristol, I've also worked with Aziz and Benali and other Greens of Colour on the reparations motion that will be going to conference this autumn. Please sign up by tomorrow night if you haven't already done that actually, please put your signature on it. Um, because what's so outrageous is that the people who profited from this appalling um, trafficking of enslaved people actually still have that wealth, but the descendants of the people who were enslaved are living in poverty in our cities today. And that's something we can address, and that's something we're demanding is addressed in Bristol and also through that reparations motion across the country. Um, but to me, it's also about atonement, it's also about us recognizing that history. And I think we can learn a lot from the way the Germans, they don't feel ashamed of their history every day, but they do recognize it and they are required to recognize it in school. And we need to do this because the failure to acknowledge and understand our history is holding us all back as a society. We can see that in terms of xen xenophobic attitudes. We can see that in terms of the Brexit vote and this absurd idea of global Britain and people just failing to understand our real place in the world. So there is an enormous learning opportunity here. And I must say, I found all the Black Lives Matter protests and the, the sort of release of energy over these past few months really exhilarating because I think what it shows is that actually all struggles are the same struggle and if we can embrace um, the struggle and the really righteous demands for justice of the black community in this country it will advance all our politics so anyway I slightly got off the topic of education there but education is central but it's not just about what happens in schools it's about us all changing our minds and reappraising our history and looking at the really dark stuff in our history and atoning for it and making reparations. 
Thank you very much for your answer there, uh, Molly. So we're going to move over to you uh, now, Amelia, and I'm just going to repeat the question one more time. Uh, and that question was, what would you push for in order to get the UK to address its barbaric colonial history, uh, particularly in education? Uh, so over to you, Amelia. Education is such a key aspect to this. I'm just going to begin by highlighting that obviously with the House of Lords, we'll be talking about all the nations. And when it comes to education, education is devolved to the Welsh Parliament, Scottish Parliament and uh, Assembly, the Assembly in Northern Ireland. Um, so, but in terms, so when we lobby for these things, we must ensure that we recognise the different parts of decision making when it comes to making change happen and not forget that we also need to lobby those institutions as well. It's incredible, isn't it, how celebrated someone like Winston Churchill is without recognising the role that he's had for massacres around the world the effect of racism that he, he held that led to the death of so many people. It means that there's this bias when you try and expose and talk about the problematic parts of our history, because people have a unique understanding about what history looks like. I look at what's happened with Black Lives Matter, as uh, the, uh, the others have said, and it's just been an incredible time and it's just to see how many voices have been able to change so much understanding of our history and that must be embedded in our curriculum to make sure that we are institutionalizing that change for generations to come. I think about the uh, in, in Cardiff we've just had a statue removed I think it's ridiculous that uh, there was so much talk about it going to a museum from where it is in City Hall. The museum's next door. It just, it wouldn't have taken any time at all to have moved that statue. Um, a man that was celebrated, Picton, uh, despite the fact he, affected, he, he raped a 14 year old, he, a 14 year old girl, um, just because he thought there was nothing wrong with it uh, because of her race. We need to be making sure that we're talking about reparations and I'm so proud of everyone that's part of those campaigns, making sure that we are addressing issues in our history while ensuring that we are talking about climate justice as well as supporting communities across the country. It's so vitally important that we're doing that work at the grassroots and everywhere we have power. And I really hope we will have that kind of power in the House of Lords as well. Because that history has entrenched racist views for hundreds of years. And the reality is that those ra that racism is still alive today. And so we need to do just take those steps to address the continued inequalities that we have in our communities. We, I agree with what Molly says, it's white is the de default as well. It's just incredible the impact that that has. Uh, and I think it's important that we recognize the intersectionalities of that as well. And by an assumption of what the default is, um, it's not just about wh whiteness, it will also be about gender and sexuality and all of those aspects as well. I also think it's really important that we talk about how a universal basic income can also work to address some of these inequalities and hundreds of years of racist systems and patriarchal systems and the intersectional sections in between. And I think it's a key policy where we need to be talking about uh, how we should be talking about uh, yeah, supporting uh, BME, but people of colour, black communities across the UK. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Amelia. Um, and thanks very much, everyone there, because we pretty much stuck to that three minute uh, soft limit, which works pretty well. Uh, we might struggle to do that with the next question. And I do have to apologise for uh, springing such a big one on you. And um, this one will answer uh, in the order of Molly, then Amelia and Andrew. Uh, so first to you, Molly, uh, if Greens were in government, what is your kind of vision for what the world would look like? Three minutes and now I've lost some time being muted as well. Um, I wrote a book actually deliberately designed to explain to people what it might be like and it was called The Bioregional Economy and while I was writing it, I started writing it when Rosa, my daughter, was 14 and uh, she was like, nah mum, you know that sounds awful because there's no electronic gadgetry in it, you know. There was some but not enough for her taste. But by the time she, like by the time I'd finished writing it four years later, she was like, yeah you might have a point. So I think I was quite convincing actually. But I would say that there's a, so the first thing is that your your needs will be met. You wouldn't be having to be afraid that you couldn't find somewhere to live or have a, a, a fundamental income because we would have universal basic income and we would have a different policy on housing. I'm actually not really sure that housing should be in a market at all. I think it's really problematic because it means that obviously 
you know, it's, it's something so basic. I don't think it should be organised in a market. But anyway, so you know, we are, we do have publicly provided health. It should be properly funded. We should also have publicly provided housing, and we should have a universal basic income. So the reason for doing those things is that it prevents you having to be a wage slave. And for me, the problem with our politics is we've got two parties, both of which basically believe in wage slavery, just from other sides of the of the picture. So you've got, you know, a party that's defending the capital side of the equation and a party that's defending the labour side of the equation. But as Greens, we've got a much more radical view of the world because we don't think you're just worth something because you go to work. We think that you're, you know, a beautiful human being who has a right to self-expression and to become whatever it was you were meant to be in the world. So, you know, we have basically a sort of hippie view of the world or Jesus's view of the world where you're a very precious individual. And that, to me, is something that would take away so many of the stresses and strains that people go through when they feel they're not matching up to what they should be, or they're forced to go to work when it just makes them depressed. And um, basic income would achieve that, I think. It would just liberate people from being wage slaves. And that's why, to me, it's a, it's a brilliant policy. But then the, the other point about the bioregional economy is that life would be much more local and your identity would be much more about defining yourselves in terms of your local community. Um, rather than in terms of where you go to work or you know what you've just been shopping for and so um i mean yeah it's a shame you can't come back at me and tell me what you think about this because uh, obviously i live in stroud and everybody here thinks this is a brilliant idea and we have an apple festival with 247 different types of apple and all that sort of stuff about what it means to live in stroud and not everybody can live in a community like that i understand that but I do think the way forward is to learn a lot from the people who haven't been trashing the planet during their many years of existence. And as an MEP, I had a real privilege to work with a lot of indigenous people, particularly from the Amazon, but also from other parts of the world. And their understanding of their connection with place, I think is really precious and valuable. And that's something that to me, helps us reconnect with our, our local place and therefore essentially not trash it so that that was the point of the bioregional approach it's just like embedding yourself in your local community and your local environment and to me that's a really important part of the green vision as well i figure i'm slightly running out of time here am i yeah 30 more seconds or so and we can wrap up oh 30 more seconds anyway i mean i'm not i'm not going to completely sell you this right now i feel but but i do think it's something about having a sense of being a global citizen while at the same time being very committed to your local place and your local environment. And to me, getting that balance right, while having your economic needs essentially underwritten so that you're not in stress, the stress of the capitalist labor market all the time, are two aspects that I think are really, really precious and valuable about the green vision. Brilliant, uh, thank you so much, Molly, and sorry having uh, to force you to compress that answer into such a small space of time. Uh, we'll go straight on to Amelia for her answer to this question. Um, and one more time, Amelia, that was, if Greens were in government, what is your vision for what the world would look like? What an amazing vision. And to even have got there, a number of things would have had to have happened. To begin with, we would have had to have reformed our demo broken democracy and ensured that we had a more progressive way to ensure that we had people elected, as well as ensure reforming our media, which creates such a severe bias in the information that we have access to and is held by a handful of, of multimillionaires who influence decisions and thought across the country and around the world. And to create that world, the world that we would have created obviously would be a, a Green Party vision. I'm always really proud that our policies are about the kind of world that we can create, not what we want to do in the next five years, but we create a manifesto that is simply the stepping stones to getting there. We'd ensure that people's well-being was thought about, as well as their opportunities in life. I think that by the, the way that we challenge growth for the sake of growth, the way we talk about GDP, uh, and ensure that we're creating more sustainable systems that create effectively a better way of working for people and for planet. Those fundamental principles like a universal basic income will provide different opportunities for everyone, especially young people. I feel like as someone that got made redundant in the last recession, uh, and it was absolutely shit, sorry if for anybody else that is experiencing this, it shouldn't be on the shoulders of a generation to shoulder the burden of a problem that they did not cause. Um, 
And I think that the opportunities that get cut away from us as younger people, uh, whether that's needing, seeing those uh, jobs that are low paid, if they're paid at all, being given to those who have uh, either lots of money from their family or maybe are lucky enough to have a home in that location just, just shows the kind of inequality, as well as meaning that so many young people aren't able to pursue the careers they want. We will have always, obviously have tackled the climate emergency, ensuring that we are an ecological emergency with a stronger connection to nature and the environment, ensuring that people's right to breathe will have been entrenched in all of the work that we've done. But for me, I feel like I am constantly campaigning for human rights, workers' rights, environmental protection and peace. And to have created that world, I feel like I'm not having to fight against terrible policy that entrenches inequalities while destroying our planet would be the biggest relief that I think any of us can have. And we can ensure that we were creating a collaborative politic that's about communities and about people. And I think at the heart of that would also be proudly pro-migration and ensuring that we would, had tackled xenophobia and believed that migration was beautiful and supported the, the diverse people and cultures that we enjoy as a result of migration here in the UK and around the world. I think uh, I basically what we do if we, as Greens is to try and create that in every place that we get elected. And if I'm honest, like I'm so proud that we do have those clear visions and proud of all of us who work to, so hard to make sure that we take steps to getting there. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for your answer to that one, uh, Amelia. So we're going to go over to Andrew for the last answer to this question. Um, and just one more time, that question was, uh, if Greens were in government, what is your vision for what the world would look like? Over to you, Andrew. Uh, one of the things I've, I've learned over the years of, uh, of being an elected politician is that uh, what people really want is um, is safety and security they want they what they want from politics is that is is to know that they're going to be okay and that um, that their future is going to be more secure than than it, it would be otherwise and so uniquely the green party is in, in in a great position to to actually um provide that for people and if we can just simply get the message across uh, that uh, of what we can do for people uh, we would get so many more votes so to do that i mean we look at things like housing um, social housing yes is really important and we need to be building lots more council houses and they need to be low energy council houses but we need to end the right to buy um, public um, public housing is a public good and uh, and it should not be poverty housing shouldn't, shouldn't social housing it should be housing that, uh, that that's an option for people and that will help reduce house prices because when people have another option they've got um, they don't have to buy a house and that and being a slave to a mortgage is no longer one of the things you, you need we've also got to look at lower energy demand right through the whole uh, of uh, the economy uh, and that means people's houses. So all the houses that exist today, we've got to do a mass retrofit program to lower the energy demand. So energy companies become, um, have less, much less power, literally. Uh, and, um, and people use less energy uh, and uh, with a net impact on, on the environment. And of course, the energy that is produced has got to be produced from renewable sources. And um, Molly's mentioned about the citizens' income scheme. Yes, we need to look at that, but we need to look at uh, people's wider um, needs uh, being met as well. Um, local production for local needs, uh, very much localizing our economies, being less reliant on globalization. Uh, and the more things that can be produced locally, uh, the better, the more secure our economy. Um, uh, and I, I think one of the things we do need to look at is not just thinking of our own country, what I mentioned earlier on about us having a responsibility for uh, around the world. And, and yes, we should celebrate migration, but the reasons for migration should, should not be there to the same degree because people's own countries provide them with security and safety and a good, and, and a good living uh, that um, is secure for the future. So those things are, are, are really important. And we want power to be closer to people, uh, I think. People, uh, people need to feel that if they go out and vote, uh, that it has an impact on the world around them, that they really do have, have power. Um, so there's just a few thoughts. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and thanks, everyone, for your answers to those questions.
Uh, it's a warm night. I've just got back from work. So to try and inject a bit more energy in, uh, we're going to go hard and early on, on one of the funner questions. Uh, so uh, we've had a three minute ish limit up till now. If we could get these out in a, in a minute or so, or like down to a sentence, maybe that'd be brilliant. Um, and we're going the order of Amelia and Andrew, the Molly in this one. Uh, so everybody in the House of Lords, all the peers, they kind of have their names uh, and they're all names of places. So we've got like Baroness Natalie Bennett of uh, wherever she is. We've got uh, Jenny Jones of Moscombe. Uh, so, uh, if you were in the House of Lords, what would your peerage name be? Uh, and uh, super bonus points for fun or wholesome answers here. Uh, so, we'll go over to uh, Amelia for your first answers. So, I was just going to say Amelia Womack of Newport, uh, which isn't that fun, but uh, accurate. Brilliant. Maybe it's wholesome. Uh, over to you then, uh, Andrew. What would your fun, fun peerage name be? I, I hate this crap. Sorry. It's just, uh, I, I mean, I, it took me 10 years to get used to people calling me counsellor. I, I just hate deference. I, I just hate titles. Um, I, I hate the idea of the year. I mean, I hate the idea of um, Lord Cooper of Huddersfield or, or whatever, uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's all Harry Potter gibberish to me. Uh, I, I, I really... We, we need to be a modern democracy and and so um, it's the last thing i want to think about uh, so um i'll dodge the question uh very politician like uh over to you molly what's your fun peerage name you're muted oh sorry you can see me sitting here in front of Lovely Stroud, and so I'm going to be Baroness Cato of the Five Valleys, which is what we call Stroud. And I would say to Amelia that there's a great deal to be proud of in Newport, as you know, with the Newport riots, which then led to the Bristol riots. So between Bristol and Newport, we've nearly started revolutions quite a few times. So I think that's a very good moniker, Miss Al. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now back to some uh, less fun questions, um, and we'll reinstate that three-ish minute time limit. Uh, so we're going to answer this one in the order of Andrew, then Molly, uh, then Amelia. Uh, and this question, Andrew, is how will you support and advance rights for non-binary and trans people if you're elevated? Over to you, Andrew. Uh, I, guess, I guess by actively listening to them, uh, by spending time uh, hearing what, uh, what they have to say, um, I, I already do that in uh, my own local area. And um, so I would... Um, I, I would do that. I, I think there's not enough active listening in the Green Party. Um, I'm more than aware of, uh, of all the social media backwards and forwarding that's gone on on, on this issue. And, um, and listening just shouldn't be that radical a thing to actually say, but um, what, what you do come across is um, very entrenched positions and people firing things like the Battle of Jutland at each other uh, about this. So we need to be doing that. Uh, I think people um, have got to understand more what people say on either side of, um, uh, of, this, uh, of this argument that happens. Um, and, um, and nobody is really listening um, to each other. So I think that needs to be done. And that's something I would want to do with uh, non-binary and trans people. Um, so yeah, that's my answer. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, so over to you, Molly, uh, for your answer to this question. Um, and again, that was how you support and advance rights for non-binary and trans people if elevated. I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is that a lot of our policies are kind of theoretical and nobody's immediately at risk. But in the case of trans people and also non-binary people, they are at risk every day of violence. So the prejudice they face is a prejudice that can end up with them you know, being beaten up or even murdered. That happens very frequently. So the most important thing we can do in that situation is show solidarity. And that's what we do with people across the world that are facing violence and oppression. So to me, that's, that's the number one thing. Um, and I'm really proud of the fact that our policy does do that. As I said, it's taken me a while to get there because these are new issues for me and I've had to think it through. But I appreciate everybody that, that's talked to me about it and helped me really understand some of what's going on, although I've still got a lot of understanding to do. But I think the priority is just protection and showing solidarity. But after that, obviously, you have to try and share that with other people who really don't understand what these issues are. And I don't think we've been terribly good at that. I think there's been a situation where people have felt sort of pushed into a corner. And sometimes 
you know, when people are going to be changing their minds, they have to be allowed to give, be given time to reflect in peace and security to do that. And that, I think, is something the Green Party can really contribute because we have to make the case for our policy. I think our policy is right, but we do have to make the case for it. And I think that's something I think it's really important we do this because in a lot of these liberation situations, the majority of people are already with the people that are being oppressed. But I don't think that's the case with trans people. And I think the kind of support we need to show them is a support where we make the argument on their behalf with people who, who can be convinced to agree with them, but, but aren't at the moment. And I think we've got a lot of work to do in that space. And that's something I'm going to be focusing on if I get onto GPEX in terms of the external comms role. Um, and then I think what's really more valuable than anything else is actually forming a relationship or having the, you know, having the um, honour really of having a relationship with somebody who genuinely has that experience. But the other side of that, as, as Ashley Routh was saying recently on Twitter, is, you know, it's completely exhausting. You can't sort of overwhelm trans people and non-binary people by saying, oh, what's it like, actually? Or, you know, getting other people to have that conversation with them. It's, so I think somehow we have to find a way of managing that. But I, I, do think, I do think we need to do this urgently because it's clear that the government is launching a, a culture war in this space. And that will result in more... Um, violence and more vulnerability on the part of trans and non-binary people so I think we've got to be prepared and we've got to give this the right amount of energy but do that in a way that um, doesn't make other, other people feel alienated so I think it is quite a challenge for our party but personally I I would yeah I, I feel comfortable about the fact that I will be able to raise these issues in the House of Lords and you can imagine a lot of people there have had no experience of this and don't understand it at all and so it's really then about challenging this idea that there are just these binary definitions and that, that everybody's in some place on, you know, has a choice of two, which is clearly wrong. Um, but at the same time, and, and also raising the question of pronouns and so on. And I think that's something where you really need to make some progress in the House of Lords and it would be a very good setting to do that. So I imagine a lot of people there have, have no experience of this. So it's, it's about solidarity. It's about encouraging, extending the range of people who are showing that solidarity and really making the case and having a rational argument about this rather than just saying I'm right, you're wrong, because I don't think that's actually helping anybody at the moment. Thank you very much, Molly. Um, so for our last answer to this one, we're going to go over to you, Amelia. Um, and one more time, that question was how we support and advance rights for non-binary and trans people if elevated. So I'm going to begin by uh, celebrating the work of one of the other deputy leader candidates, actually, of Tom Pashby, who's done work at talking about gender neutral language within the House of Lords itself and has run a very successful campaign. Uh, the first campaign that I actually was involved in on trans rights was 15 years ago. And I think it's interesting what Molly says about we've all we've all got a story about how we've learned about trans rights. Um, I think uh, the first, as I said, the first campaign I was involved in was getting a gender neutral toilet in uh, our university when we were, when I was on the executive there. To be honest, the toilet was on the fourth floor in the middle of nowhere. I didn't know where that toilet was. Um, and we, but we like, at the time, it was really progressive. It wouldn't be good policy at all now, but because we were all making sure, we, what, what, what we wanted to ensure was that everything was accessible. Um, and I think that we've come a long way for supporting trans rights in the last 15 years, as well as an understanding of the issues that trans issues face from transphobia, having people's rights undermined and the uh, violence. And I, I mean, I feel like Twitter has exacerbated some horrendous and disgusting things. And it does go back to what's been said before about what the default is when we know so much more about gender now than we have done before while we are talking about, well, it actually goes back to the question about colonialism and how we've actually created a history of two genders within, uh, within our own history as well without acknowledging the fact that there have been multiple genders in other parts, in other um, cultures around the world. And so I think one of the things that's important is uh, talking about things like uh, in here, I know that people around the country don't have access to clear support. Uh, here in Wales, there isn't 
actually, I said this on when we, the deputy leader hustings, that there wasn't any uh, support for trans people in Wales, and that changed the next day. So suddenly there is investment in supporting trans people in Wales, but I know that there's like a, a postcode lottery across the country about where you can get support and access. And so many people are moved away from their communities, their friends, their families, uh, if, they, if they're getting support from their families. And I think it's really clear that we need to be making sure that we're supporting local support for trans people, as well as ensuring that there is support for for many other aspects of what uh, of how we support people who are experiencing gender dysphoria to ensure that we're um, giving that clear clear support we know that so many trans people um, take their own lives and I think that we need to be making sure that we have an open and welcome society so that people can be open about who they are stop this like drip dripping of transphobia that we see on social media um, I've met with social media companies and there's a huge gap between what is possible and what is happening and we've seen that again at the weekend and I think uh, there are many ways that we can work to tackle transphobia, make sure trans people have the support they need in their communities for transitioning, while also ensuring that we are working to address the way that we've got a, a default way of talking about things uh, that's not trans, that's not inclusive of everybody at the moment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Amelia. So we're gonna move straight on to our next question. Uh, and we're going to go uh, in the order of Molly, then Amelia, um, and then Andrew on this one. Uh, so, uh, Molly, this question is, how would you tackle the hostile and dehumanising language used against migrants in the House of Lords? Yeah, well, that's obviously something I've had massive experience of as an MEP, having to deal with all the Brexiter um, bastards, basically. And I tell you what's really difficult about this is dealing with it without giving it more oxygen. Um, because there's just a, a whole industry now of, of xenophobia and people deliberately creating um, scandal and controversy to make careers for themselves. And so, um, oh, I'm glad I've forgotten the name of that awful guy. Uh, Ak Sagar of Akan, do you know the guy I mean? Oh, Carl Benjamin is his real name anyway. So he was a candidate here um, in the last European Parliament elections. And I was able to take a stand refusing to share a platform with him. Um, it was incredible how many people didn't understand my need to do that. I had a row with the Archbishop of Canterbury eventually over this, and I had a, a stand-up row in person at Exeter Cathedral because I said I'm not going to go... So basically, that anyway, it's a long story. But, you know, I was saying to them, um, Jesus wouldn't have accepted that guy on the platform, and they said to me, what's that got to do with Jesus? And I had to say, here's your cathedral. You know, we'd reached that point. So... There was a complete failure to understand that certain types of language are totally unacceptable and I think we have to we have to be very clear about the dog whistling and the use of language in a way that's kind of subtle but nonetheless you know exactly what they're saying and obviously Boris Johnson is now one of the key proponents of that kind of language so I think it's it's important to have clarity about what's acceptable and not what's not acceptable and then to have the principle to stand up for that and to not then get implicated yourself. So by not sharing a platform, in some cases, I then didn't have the opportunity to speak. In other cases, then, you know, people came out and like, I was able to make my case very clearly. And with the BBC, I did some quite good negotiations. So I got slots all on my own sometimes. So, but, you know, it wasn't an easy thing to navigate, but I think it's really important to take that principal position because what I thought I was doing was standing up for all the people that are subject to that kind of abuse. And if you don't do that, then it becomes normalised. And so I think that's a really important thing to do. And the other really important thing to do is to call out the journalists when they allow that sort of insidious dog whistle language to, to, to um, permeate. And um, I did that. You know, I, I wrote to Fran Unsworth, who's the kind of boss of political programmes, telling her to tell her journalists not to use white supremacist language. She was so furious with me. Um, but quite right, because Laura Kingsburg was, you know, making reference to the Ku Klux Klan like it was some kind of joke. So, you know, I'm a Quaker, so I feel there's absolutely hard lines about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And if something's not acceptable, you just have to say that. And this is also an area like mostly in the House of Lords. I think it's really important to get along with people and you will have to get along with some pretty obnoxious people. But I think in this area, particularly at the moment, because we're seeing the rise of fascism, we're seeing, you know, um, this attempt to gain 
political power by victimizing other groups. And at the heart of fascism always is this othering and this racism. So I think on this question, and I'm sure Jenny and Natalie would be with me on this, you know, we have to actually call out the peers if they're using that kind of language and also be very clear because a lot of this is happening in the House of Commons and right up to the Prime Minister. So, yeah, I think it's, it's about solidarity with the oppressed groups, but it's also about resisting fascism because that is the, at the heart of fascism and we're seeing that strongly in our country at the moment. So I've given you some examples about where I've done that in the past and I'm more than happy to do that in the future. Um, you know, as a, as a Quaker, we have this thing called acting under conscience. And if you're doing that, then you have to break the law. You have to do whatever it takes. And this, for me, is that type of issue. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much, um, Molly. Uh, and just before we move on to Amelia, we're going to repeat that question uh, again for accessibility reasons. Um, and one more time, that question is, uh, how would you tackle the hostile and de uh, dehumanising language against migrants in the House of Lords? Over to you, Amelia. So when we set up Another Europe is Possible, one of our, our key commitments was that we were unapologetically pro-migration. And it's so vital to make sure that we are changing the agenda and language that is used around migration and being divisive, for, uh, dividing many of our communities. It's about making sure that we do tackle those dog whistles, the press and media that are effectively uh, part of this narrative that is uh, destroying our connection to all, to all parts of our, our, our communities and work. We need to show leadership on this. And as has be, as been said, call out every aspect of racism and xenophobia that happens in politics, in the House of Lords and Commons, as well as in the press and media. Supporting things like a, a Windrush Day is a genuine way to ensure that we're celebrating the work of migrants and people who choose to make the UK their home. And I think that's so vital and important to show that a welcoming and a society for people who, who do migrate here. But to be honest, I think the House of Lords has some terrible people in there. Dawn Butler has spoken to me about, about one of her experiences of being in the House of Commons and essentially a member of the House of Lords coming up to her and saying, you're not meant to be in here. It's for uh, members of parliament only. And she was like, actually, I'm an MP. And he looked her up and down and was like, well, they'll let anything in these days. We could get rid of that kind of racism and bigotry if we had an elected second chamber we'd be able to expose it and ensure that people had a choice to uh, to stop electing people with views that belong well in the dustbins of history alongside that not elected chamber and i think there's a lot that we can do for democracy for diversity for tackling racism by having genuine democracy in the uk whether that's proportional representation or whether that's a fully elected second chamber so i think that uh, that a lot of this comes down to why we need to abolish the house of lords and many of the attitudes that it seems to hold house Thank you uh, so much for that, uh, Amelia. Um, so Andrew, uh, you'll be the last to answer this question. Um, and just one more time, it is, how would you tackle the hostile and dehumanising language against migrants in a House of Lords? Well, I think we'd need uh, an effective code of conduct um, uh, with effective sanctions uh, against, uh, against the people who used such dehumanising language. Uh, and I think it's about time that, that, that one of those sanctions was to actually strip somebody of the peerage, uh, that they can actually be thrown out of the House of Lords um, for, for sustained uh, and uh, abusive language, maybe among other things as well. Uh, but actually being able to throw somebody out of the House of Lords might actually make people think about the privilege that they have uh, there. So that, that's one thing that I think we could do. Another thing is to get more people of colour uh, actually to be in the House of Lords, to be members of the House of Lords, to be um, to, to actually make uh, those those uh, th those words against uh, migrants uh, to be a little more uncomfortable uh, for certain people. You know, people like Lord Tebbit, perhaps, um, almost certainly, uh, I would have thought. We've got to be careful, though, with, with sanctions uh, and how sanctions are used against people who use language, because sometimes that can be used as a badge of honour uh, by some of these people. And I think using the party machinery um, to, uh, to bring people into line should be used uh, wherever possible. And, I, and, I, and I've seen that done effectively on my own council. On our own council, we've got a, a lot of uh, Muslim um, 
uh, members uh, from Asian members who, who run the the council and of course um, that tempers a lot of the uh, more right wing of the Conservative Party uh, and means that um, uh, that um, the, the, the language on the councils not not what it might be if they were left to their own devices so um, non, not on non platform uh, with some of the folks I, I, I've I, I was a student politician and uh, I was uh, very much in favor of non non platform for fascists and racists uh, that was that was pretty much uh, my opinion I had a bit of a wobble uh, when Nick Griffin from the BMP was on question time because he did so badly uh, that um, I thought mm, maybe we should give them a bit more rope to hang themselves with as it were uh, but um, but no I think uh, you know we should take a pretty hard line with uh, fascists and racists great uh, thanks very much everyone and um, I'm going to chuck another short quick fire fun one at you again um, so we don't get too bored uh, and we're going to go uh, Andrew Amelia Molly on this one um, uh, and uh, the question is uh, if you had to give each candidate just one present what would you give them um, and just to clear something up it can be one present for the both of them or a present each if you like um, over to you Okay, I wish I had more time to think about this. Um, oh, crikey. Oh, no. Um, I've got three minutes, haven't I? Well, you're going to be sitting around for about a minute while I try and think of some... Oh, I've got a minute. Oh, right, okay. Um, Malinson's, they're both going to get a bottle of Malinson's beer, which is beer that is uh, brewed in the ward I represent. Uh, the brewery is run by women, so, so they would appreciate that. Uh, being women and they run the company uh, and um, it's beautiful beer I very much appreciate it um, and um, yeah and um, yeah it's good drink Malinson's beer from Huddersfield brilliant uh, I'm sure they're paying you for that little plug though uh, perfect uh, <laughs> we'll hand you over to uh, Amelia um, for her answer to this one I'm going to be a true green and recycles my answer of uh, I'd get you all some hummus because it's the traditional green party dish <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, thanks, Amelia. Molly, which presents uh, would you get? This is like those, the question at the end of any questions now that everybody dreads, isn't it? But I'm going to buy Andrew an iron because, as some of you know, when he used to stay with me in Brussels, he was the only person that ever used the iron in that flat. So I know how much he loves ironing. And I'm going to buy Amelia a radical tea towel of the Newport riots. I've got some radical details myself, and I think you mustn't use it for drying up, obviously, which is also a waste of time. You can stick it on your wall and feel proud of Newport. Thank you very much, um, Molly. So we're going to go barrel straight on to our next uh, serious question uh, in the order of Amelia um, and then Andrew and then Molly. Uh, so this question, um, Amelia, is do you have any particular vision for the future of the House of Lords or uh, the UK Second Chamber? Uh, so, for example, how it's elected, where it's located, its powers, or perhaps most importantly, uh, over to you. So I think I've already talked about this, and I think there are far better ways that our entire democracy can be run. It's not just the House of Lords that is broken, but I think that uh, effectively it shows this antiquated system. Like... Uh, Jenny always jokes about the stuff like having to hand, hand, hang her sword on her hook and only allowed to be able to talk in certain parts of uh, the building. And uh, I think that, you know, we, we talk about history, but history shouldn't dominate our lives. Tradition shouldn't be what creates the frame for the future. And we need to have something fit for the 21st century. The only thing that is fit for the 21st century is having a fully elected second chamber that is elected in a proportional way. Um, I think fundamentally, uh, there are way the second chamber is a body that makes sure that it scrutinizes. Scrutiny is the vital, important role that it plays. And there can be much that's talking about uh, different term limits compared to the House of Commons, as well as talking about different ways of electing. That I think means that we can embed democracy into a second chamber. That means there is proper scrutiny and uh, Kind of genuine things like cross-party working that makes sure that policy is strong and works for everybody and as a result of that that is how we get a stronger kind of politics that represents different generations different genders different uh people from different backgrounds and uh i think it's really fundamental not just for us as greens but for us as a country and a democracy and if we haven't got an elected second chamber in my lifetime then i think we will have failed uh, as progressive people who are campaigning for to make sure that democracy is at the heart of everything that we do. 
Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Amelia. Um, so, Andrew, uh, one more time for the question you're about to face, uh, okay. and that is, do you have any particular vision for the future of the House of Lords um, or Second Chamber? Uh, for example, how it's elected, where it's located, its powers, or perhaps a different name? Okay, uh, the future of the House of Lords um, ab abolished um, is, uh, is, is, the, is the first answer to that question. Um, but in a new second chamber, um, I, I'd like to see it, uh, of course, elected by proportional representation. I, I'd like to see a lot more regional representation, that, that it's actually rep more representative of the country geographically, but also quotas to ensure representation from across wider society. I, I think that's, uh, that's really important in terms of uh, genders and, and uh, race. Everything. So it, it is a much more representative chamber than it exists at the moment, and, and age as well. Um, location, um, I've got two answers to this question. Huddersfield, uh, which of course is pretty much in the centre of the country uh, and, and so therefore is the obvious place uh, from that point of view. But the, the, a more serious answer is everywhere uh, because uh, one of the things we've seen during lockdown is that uh, people in the House of Lords have been able to participate it w through remotely. Uh, and uh, be involved remotely and being able to vote and participate in uh, in the debates uh, there. So why not in the future? Uh, another thing, if, if you are having a location, people should be able to vote from their seats. The idea that these folks get up and wander into a room somewhere and get counted off is bizarre. People should be able to privately vote from the, uh, the comfort of their own chair or mobile phone, uh, because that's perfectly possible. So, uh, yeah, abolished and based in Huddersfield. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, so, Molly, just before we go to you, I'm going to repeat that question one more time. Uh, and it was, do you have any particular vision for the future of the House of Lords or the UK Second Chamber? Um, for example, how it's elected, where it's located, its powers, or perhaps a different name? Well, it is a tradition of every new Green peer that they immediately put down a motion for the abolition of the House of Lords. And I'm sure that I, along with the other candidates, would follow that tradition. But I think the first question we should ask is whether we actually need two chambers, because some of the best democracies in the world, like the Scandinavian ones, actually only have one chamber. But anyway, I am a fan of two chambers. And the reason is what Amelia said, which is that it's good to have a chamber that kind of revises and keeps the first chamber in check. <laughs> but to do that, it's got to be slightly different from the first chamber. And at the moment, I think with Brexit, you saw very clearly that when the House of Commons gets itself into a mess, in most countries at that point, the second chamber would have stepped in and sorted things out and kind of like restrained the worst things that were happening in, in the primary chamber. But because our um, House of Lords had no democratic authority, they didn't really feel competent to do that. And that's one of the reasons we've ended up in this really completely devastating mess over Brexit that's going to be so bad for our country. So um, I think I do value having a second chamber that's an expert chamber and a revising chamber. And so I think we have to think very carefully about how we put people in there. And my personal favorite plan is to elect it in three parts. And the first part would be um, by, re, uh, by a national list system. And obviously that would make sure that Greens were fairly represented. But the second third, I would elect um, on a regional basis like the, the Germans do for their Bundesrat, and that would ensure that you had good regional representation, but it would also mean that people like me, coming from the Southwest, I could feel that I was genuinely there to represent the Southwest, because <laughs> at the moment people aren't really there to represent very much at all. And the last third, I would choose, um, and it's 300 in my vision of the House of Lords, so 100 in each of these sections, and the last third would be chosen by electoral college of sort of grandee politicians to really meet the criteria for expertise that we need. There's some great experts in there at the moment, like Martha Lane Fox and um, Tani Gray Thompson and um, Lord Robert Winston. I mean, I'm not always a fan of him, but you know, people that really know what they're talking about are very valuable. Um, and the electoral college could choose a, a good selection of those people. But I also think we need to ask whether these two chambers are enough. And my own view is that, that our parliament would really benefit from having a sort of additional, not necessarily a chamber, but a citizens assembly kind of tacked on that could do a different kind of work because we saw in Ireland with the abortion referendum how valuable it was to put that through a citizens assembly first, but that would be a much more kind of deliberative process than is possible in the kind of cut and thrust of the two chambers we've got. And other than how I would redesign it, I would like it to move around the country. And I think if you especially had only 300 people, it's quite feasible to, to move them around the country so that it, it doesn't really live anywhere. It just belongs 
to the country at large and uh, people can can travel like the wonderful GPRC we ourselves have. Um, so then everybody feels it's, it's for them and, and they're a part of it. Perfect. Uh, thank you uh, very much for that. Um, Molly, so we've reached the end of, um, end of the list for that question uh, and we'll go straight on to the next one. Uh, we're doing well on the answer limits. It'd be great if we could kind of move down towards uh, like two minutes or two and a half minutes just because we've got a couple more we want to get through before, um, before we end. Uh, so this next question um, we'll answer in the order of Andrew, then Molly um, and then Amelia. Uh, and it is how will you help to provide opportunities to young people or young greens who may want to go down a similar path to yourself so kind of I guess the root of politics and um, over to you Andrew. Well as, as a councillor I've had many um, students um, it, pr practically each year from the, the politics department um, come and shadow, shadow me and, and it's, it, it roughly works out to about 50% uh, leafleting with me uh, and, uh, and about 50% um, get going into interesting meetings and doing interesting things and going places that they wouldn't norm normally go to uh, and shadowing me in my, in my work and so I, I would be very much up for uh, providing those opportunities to, to young people. It's something I, I, I've done all, already. Um, and and um, so I'd be very much up for that. Um, I, I think one of the things I would I, I mentioned earlier on that I would very much like to have a sort of young and student greens contact group uh, that could I could work with. So when I'm doing uh, my business plan for the the coming year, that I'd probably working on with other members of the House of Lords, uh, that they could have some input into that uh, and uh, be a regular contact group that I, I, I could work with. So regular work experience, but also something which is, is a wee bit more um, systematic and or, you know, or, or organically linked into it to what we, uh, what we do. Um, so there's a few thoughts. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. So, uh, Molly, how would you help to provide opportunities to young people slash young greens who may want to go down a similar path to yourself? Oh, and you're muted. You did that to me. I didn't do that. Um, I have worked with some really excellent young greens in the European Parliament, particularly closely with uh, Terry Reinke and Ernest Ottersen from Barcelona. And um, I'm really impressed by the sort of training and support models that they have. And I think a lot of that works through the European Greens. And I think that the British Green Party, we could connect with that better. Um, I'm sure you all know more about that than I do. But, I, you know, I, I found that maybe the sense that they have that power to move into really, really helps as well. But, yeah, I think that there's some good role models there. And I'm sure they would be happy as well to contribute um, to this process of really helping um, young Greens really to grow into the role of being a politician because it's quite difficult when you don't have that many politicians there because when I was being an MEP I was just so strapped for time you know um, I decided not to offer um, I had I had regular interns but I decided not to offer work shadowing just because I didn't think it would be worth the while of young people because I just literally didn't have the time to spend um, and I, the trouble is if you've only got one MP and three Lords you know trying to cover the whole lot of legislation it's quite difficult and you don't want to do it badly and just waste people's time. So um, I, d I feel I did do mentoring as an MEP in terms of my staff and I have, inter um, because of the uh, external comms role, I've offered to mentor two young Greens who want to learn more about how to become a, an economist Green politician. So um, that offer is open to anybody listening or anybody else. But um, yeah, I think, like Andy says, I think we need to find a better way of doing this because up to now, I, have, I don't feel I've really had time to do this. And it's something that I think we do need a more formal structure in the Green Party about how to actually be a part of the experience of being a politician. Because there's, there's things you can't really know until you've done it. And sometimes that would make people think, wow, that's so fantastic, I really want to do that. But equally, it might make them think, actually, that's probably not for me. And it's really valuable if you get a chance to know what the human impacts are of doing that job and what it really feels like. Um, you can't really do that except through experiencing it and through learning from other people's experience. So I think between us, we should probably try and set up some systems to help that happen. Um, because yeah, but, but at the moment, you know, with so few people in parliament, it's quite difficult, but I still think we should, we should find a way to share the experience of being a legislator. It's just such an annoying thing that we don't still have 
MEPs because we kind of had enough of those then to make that a reality. But um, anyway, that's many reasons I'm frustrated about Brexit. But yeah, I think it's something that we need to, to discuss more and I'd be happy to do that. I'm sure the other candidates would as well. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Molly. Uh, perfect time as well. Um, so we'll move on to Amelia for the last answer to this question. Uh, and one more time, that question was, how will you help to provide opportunities to young people uh, slash young Greens who may want to go down a similar path to yourselves? So when I was first elected deputy leader, I was still a young Green. And I think one of the vital parts of support that I think uh, definitely helped me and I hope has continued to help people when I've tried to, to support young Greens as well, is about making sure that we're removing the barriers as to why people aren't getting involved. Uh, in many ways, that's about confidence and training and opportunities. I've often done Young Greens training on public speaking, and I think the areas like policy, Young Greens often tell me that one of the reasons that they don't want to be uh, running as candidates or being heard is as a result of not feeling confident enough about policy and actually making sure we're listening to where there might be a skills gap and addressing that through genuine training, um, as well as obviously part of the mentoring skills that happen. I think that's why 30 under 30 is such a powerful thing and uh, engagement from politicians in that is so vitally important so that we can talk from real experience and ensure that it's uh, training that uh, supports specific avenues for everyone to get involved in. But I think in politics as a whole, um, I get frustrated that young people so often aren't listened to. And again, those kind of intersectional aspects of being a young woman, like I can't be begin to tell you how many times I've been asked whose assistant I am. And uh, I think it's really vital that we make sure that young people have a clear voice in politics. And it's been incredible, the work of the young Greens who have worked to get Green councillors elected, making sure that there's stronger diversity in councils and people who are most affected by policy um, because it's young people that have received this uh, the, that intergenerational inequality that we've heard from the other candidates as well. Uh, young people being part of the conversation to address that is so vitally important. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I feel like it's important that we have a younger Lord so that we've got better diversity within our group as well as within Parliament, making sure that a generation is represented because for too often young people have simply been failed by politics because young people are not at the table. So yeah, remove, talk, ensure that we have an open conversation, removing the barriers as to why people aren't engaging through training and mentoring and opportunity and making sure that the voices of young people are truly valued. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for those answers. Uh, we're kind of barreling along to the end here, so we're going to go for maybe one more um, substantive question before we start wrapping up. Uh, and we're going to answer this one in the order of uh, Molly, then Amelia, um, and then Andrew, um, and maybe on a bit of a lighter note as well. Um, so Molly, could you please tell us about how and why you joined the Green Party? Oh God, that's so long ago. Um, not quite as long ago as Andy, but nearly. Um, this was a really weird thing because um, I was always really political. Like when I was at school, I set up UCND in my hometown of Bath when I was 16 and I was always really interested in politics. I studied politics, but I never really thought I'd become active in politics. And then um, it was basically having a kid that did it for me. And uh, he's now 32. So that tells you how long ago it was. And yeah, he was about 18 months old and I was just sitting on a bus one day and I thought, you know, I have to do something about this. And um, I didn't really know what to do, but I was having dinner one time with a refugee friend of mine. There were a lot of Latin American refugees. I lived in Oxford at the time and he was called Jaime. And uh, he said to me, um, he was a Marxist, he was a communist and that's why he'd had to leave Chile. But he said to me, you know, you're a green. And I said, what on earth are you talking about? Because I didn't even know there was a political thing called green in those days. That also tells you how long ago it was. And um, yeah, and then the, a bit later I was sitting on the bus and I thought, oh God, yeah, I see what he means. I am a green. And so I joined the Green Party. But I can tell you that at that time, when I first went canvassing for the Greens, even in Oxford, and I'd knock on the door, people would say, what's the Green Party? So that tells you we've come a long way in those 30 years. Although obviously we haven't done enough and we haven't gone far enough. But yeah, that, that was... Um, that was why I joined the Green Party and I just agreed with everything and it was fantastic to find a party where obviously you can have a few niggles with policy but the whole vision and the whole purpose and values of the party was exactly what I'd always wanted politically and it was just rather weird that it took a Chilean communist to point that out to me. Uh, thank you so much Molly. Uh, so um, Amelia uh, we'll move over to you so could you please tell us about how and why you joined the Green Party? So 
Given uh, what I told you about my what I did in academia with uh, my BSc in environmental biology, uh, it probably doesn't surprise you that I was very passionate about the environment, wanting to make sure that we were doing things to make change happen. I still can't believe that all of the predictions that were happening then and now I, I didn't believe that we'd get to a point where it would be a re reality. Well, I was feeling that uh, my first election I voted in was just a couple of months after I turned 18 as a by-election was triggered in my lo local ward here in Newport. I was I got a leaflet uh, from the Green candidate and uh, my mum basically gave me all of the leaflets for all of the political parties uh, being in Wales that included Plaid Cymru, uh, a political party that wanted to take our bit of Wales back into England and uh, she told me to read them all and to vote for what I believe in. And so probably doesn't surprise you that I voted green and have voted green ever since. And having re read that leaflet, I truly believed in those values and wanted to join the party. Admittedly, I didn't join the party immediately. Um, I, I didn't go to university straight away, but I did want to get that kind of university experience that was more reflective of, of what uh, maybe a 1970s university, university experience would be of working for radical politics. And so the day that I graduated, I joined the Green Party. There wasn't a Young Greens at the time. I think I probably would think quite differently now. I probably would have got involved with the Young Greens. As it turned out, I got involved in People and Planet instead. Um, and that's why. I always think it's so powerful to have paper candidates because you just do not know who you're going to inspire. That's very true. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Amelia. And sorry, just uh, before we go to you, Andrew, I'm just going to repeat the question again, uh, which will be, uh, can you please tell us about how and why you joined the Green Party? Uh, go on, Andrew. Okay, so, so back in the dawn of time, uh, 1988, um, I, I joined the Green Party. and. And prior to that, uh, confession time, I was a member of the Young Liberals for, for, for four years. Uh, and I, I joined, the, I joined the, the Liberal Party, not the Liberal Democrats, but the Liberal Party, uh, because my local experience of Labour was they were you know, old, a lot of old guys who, who basically, you know, old guys who knew best. Um, and uh, I didn't like that at all. Uh, I, I, I never was a big fan of the Conservatives, never liked Margaret Thatcher, never liked what her politics, what she was about. So that didn't mean much to me. So that's where I was. And I, I learned my trade of, um, of how to fight elections. They, they were very good at fighting elections, uh, the Liberals. They knew how to do it and they knew how to um, fight against um, a, a stronger opposition. Uh, and so I learned my trade there, which helped me later on. Um, then I, I, when I studied politics, I, um, I, uh, I uh, got quite into anarchism and I thought, actually, I quite like anarchism, liberalism, anarchism, it's a bit of a journey. Uh, and so um, I, I looked at that and that formed quite a lot of the, the background to, to my politics, a lot of my thought. I was quite into, uh, I remember Michael Bakunin at the time, uh, quite an interesting political philosopher. Um, and um, and so I uh, I eventually thought um, the Liberals are going to join the Social Democrats, uh, and I don't think that's going to end well. I didn't like, and it didn't actually, um, as we saw what they did in government. So I I didn't like that much, and I joined the Green Party, and I went to my first Green Party meeting in Huddersfield in, in 1988. It was above uh, the Rat and Ratchet pub, which still exists today in Huddersfield. And I went to my first meeting and uh, there was a, a friend of mine who was there, uh, an old friend who's still a, a good friend of mine, uh, my old retired English teacher who was drunk and asleep at the table uh, of the meeting, um, a, a guy who you would describe as a, uh, as a hippie, you know, as in like Neil from the Young Ones, who, who a dog came and sniffed his leg and urinated on it during the meeting. It was, it was, I think it, what, what have you done? Uh, was, uh, was, was my, what, what exactly have you done here? So, um, yeah, it, it was, it's been an interesting journey since then. Um, we took it in 1988. Um, we took it from um, not very good to winning our first council seat in eight years. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been tremendous fun. I, I've uh, all loved being a member of the Green Party and, uh, Hope to do so for many more years. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. I think that's been my favourite question through the whole three uh, 
<laughs> three house things there. There's some quite good answers. Uh, brilliant. Uh, so I said that was the last substantive question. We do have one more question, um, which is the classic for the end of these, as it turns out. Um, so maybe we'll go in the order of Andrew, then Amelia, then Molly um, for this one. Uh, and of course, the question is, Andrew, what's your favourite biscuit? A jammy dodger. Seems to be a popular, um, popular answer there. Uh, I think we said we go to Amelia next. For your favourite uh, biscuit again. Anyone who's met me, if I, I'll arrive at a local party or wherever I'm going with a cup of tea. If I'm very lucky, I leave with a cup of tea. So I like the best biscuit that does go with tea um, and to dunk in tea. And that has to be the humble rich tea. Mm. Excellent. Um, and Molly, you evaded this, uh, this question on our uh, written hosting for GFEX. Uh, but what is I'm, your favourite biscuit? Don't worry, I'm not ashamed of my love of biscuits. I just <laughs> wanted to get a sort of right on economics answer about the apple cake. But I, I'm a bit with Amelia here. I think the rich tea is a very underrated biscuit, but I'm going to go for a ginger nut. Nice. Brilliant. Uh, well, perfect. Uh, thank you to all the candidates. It's been brilliant having you. Um, just before we let you go, we're going to go to our kind of two minute final appeals here. Uh, and I think for these ones, we're going to go in uh, the order of Andrew um, and Amelia um, and then Molly. Uh, so, Andrew, uh, if you could give us two minutes uh, of a kind of final. Okay. Um, th th I've got to say that I think my strongest card is that I'm, I'm an elected uh, Green uh, and, and the Green Party sending an elected politician to the House of Lords says, says an awful lot. Uh, the fact that I actually have a constituency of people who I can refer to um, is, uh, I, I think, invaluable. I mean, the, the local lockdown that we, we've had here in, uh, in Kirklees as well as other parts of the country, uh, my, my phone's been buzzing from people who wanted help and advice, um, many of whom I confess were beauticians and hairdressers today who wanted to know whether they could visit people's homes. Uh, but it's real stuff. It's, it's, it's real things which affect people's uh, everyday lives. And, and the other strong card I have is that I've, I've achieved uh, Green Party policies uh, and that uh, the free insulation scheme which was taken up by lots of councils around the country the uh, the, the, the policy which uh, I got passed which um, effectively banned fracking in our council's local plan uh, the, the way that I've uh, been able to influence global politics um, by getting the concept of locally determined contributions uh, uh, accepted at a, at a global level uh, and influencing the UN climate, uh, the, the UN climate talks a couple of years ago. And so all these things show that when I'm actually involved in a political institution, whether it's a council, whether it's a parish council, whether it's the United Nations, that, that I'm finding ways uh, of, of actually making things succeed. And that's what I would intend to do in the House of Lords. So if I did get elected um, by you as your, your number one choice, uh, you would see things happen. Uh, you would see me taking opportunities to do things uh, uh, and also um, having a planned programme of work which would uh, see real change. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Andrew. And, and thank you again for joining us tonight. Uh, so, Amelia, you've got two minutes for your final appeal, please. Thank you. So I've been elected on three occasion to, occasions to represent you, the party, making sure that we're pushing our policies to ensure that we create the kind of the kind of policies that work for people and planet. I will continue that commitment that I've always given with unwavering dedication and perseverance to ensure that I'm using the skills that I've built from this to deliver change in the House of Lords. I may not have a seat. But I've been imaginative and influential in the political agenda, ensuring that we make change happen, whether that's working cross party to make sure that uh, the policy, the um, things on women's rights are now going through uh, the parliamentary procedure, procedures by working cross party or whether that's asking questions on issues around Grenfell Tower representing a community that was forgotten by politics the only way I was able to do that was via Caroline Lucas and every question she asked about the tower was uh, came directly from me working to ensure that people in that community were being heard I've worked to build the role of deputy leader in so many different ways, even doing things like working with artists on making sure that we're talking about how a universal basic income affects the arts and making sure, as I said before, that we work to change a narrative on many of those big issues. That's not been because I've had an office surrounding me. It's be, be because I've been working with pure perseverance to make sure that we change the political agenda. And I know that I can build that power to make sure we can have real influence in the House of Lords. 
I think it's so vital to ensure whoever we elect is more of a, a Trojan horse within the House of Lords that isn't about tradition or institutionalised knowledge, but it's about changing structures to ensure that we are going to work to create a better political system that works for everyone. I think it's so vital as Greens, we always work for human rights, workers' rights, environmental protection and peace, and everything that I do will have that at its heart. Thank you very much, uh, Amelia, um, and thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, so over to you, Molly, uh, for a two minute final appeal. Thank you, Tom. So I've also been elected as a councillor and here in Stroud, I led the Green Group when we took power from the Tories, which was definitely one of the better days of my life. I also hold the record for um, the largest vote, getting 18% last May to get re-elected to the European Parliament. So I'm a winner. I'm a winner, guys. But this time, because I don't have to be elected, and my main claim to fame, I would say, in terms of the House of Lords, is that I'm the candidate who's had experience of legislation. And I think it's also effective experience. I was the European Parliament's Rapporteur on Sustainable Finance, and I introduced that topic into the Parliament. And I managed to connect my academic knowledge um, with the sort of policies that we needed to change on the Monetary Policies Committee. So that means that because of the work I did changing the way these benchmarks work, billions of pounds will now go in the direction of the sustainable economy that would previously have gone into you know, the, the dirty industries of the past. So I have actually made change on a big scale and I really would like to, to be in the House of Lords to see if I could persuade other peers to support me in doing similar things there. I've also had a lot of experience of dealing with the media. I've also taken on Andrew Neil, and I think, you know, I accredited myself pretty well in that. Um, I always try and appear like the voice of reason, maybe not so much tonight, but uh, I always have that in my head when I'm doing media, because I don't think our policies are radical. To me, they're just completely sensible and mainstream, and I think that kind of approach really does help to convince people. It's important to not be defensive when you're putting our policies forward. And lastly, I really think it's important that we get a high platform for our economic policies, because again, one of the reasons we lack credibility is that people think, oh, you might know about the environment or even about energy or climate, but do you really understand how to run the economy? And I think it's that gap that I can really help to fill. I was doing that as an MEP, and I'm immensely frustrated that I had that power taken away from me, but I think the House of Lords is another platform where I could start to convince people that Greens not only understand the issues that we're usually Thank you. associated with. Molly, but I'm going also... to put in there because we've hit two minutes. Yeah, okay, Brilliant. no problem. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Molly, and thanks all the candidates for joining. Um, it's been a great hosting tonight. It was definitely the most relaxing one to chair. Uh, so I've had a good time, um, and I hope everybody else has too. Uh, so, candidates, you're free to go, you're free to hang around, whatever. Um, but for the rest of you here, I'm going to hand you over to Katrina. Uh, who's going to give you a bit more information on what we've got coming up uh, and some links over. I am indeed. Thanks, Tom. Um, and thanks, Amelia, Molly and Andrew for coming along and for your answers. I have to say, I also enjoyed the stories of how you all joined the Green Party. That was great. Um, thanks, everyone, for your questions and just for coming along today. I won't keep you too long, but as you will know, if you've been on these calls before, I will be popping some links in the chat. Uh, firstly, for more hustings tomorrow, this time for the leadership of the Young Greens. So everyone on this call is a young green with some notable exceptions for our candidates. Um, so this really is your election um, and we'll be deciding who will be representing you over the next year. We'll hear from candidates for the Young Greens Executive Committee, Structures and Procedures Committee and the Green Students Committee. Um, so I'm just copying and pasting that link now. Uh, the next link will take you to our donation page where we're asking people who are in a position to if they can give us two pounds a month uh, to support our work as the Young Greens. We've got a really big year coming up um, and this will allow us to support Young Greens in elections. Of course we have last year's delayed elections as well as next year's elections and um, support us in campaigning around the country to continue our political education programme to run events and to make all our activity as accessible as possible. Um, I know it's a very difficult time for a lot of people, so obviously this is only for those who are in a position to do so. Um, all our events, all our activity is always open to everyone, regardless of financial situation. Oh, on my first link didn't work. Sorry about that, let's try it again. So I've just put the donation link in. Oh, ah, and now people keep sending me messages telling me my links aren't working. So then my next message is just going directly to them. Okay, right, so that's one link in there. And the second link is going in now. 
Okay, they should be good. Uh, the next one I don't have a link for, so we won't have quite the same chaos. Um, but the 15th and 16th of August uh, is our Young Greens convention online for the first time. Well, that rhymes. Maybe we should use that as a slogan. Uh, online for the first time. Hey. Uh, hold the dates in your diary, 15th and 16th of August. Uh, keep an eye on your inboxes and our social media channels, and we'll be sending out the sign up link soon. Uh, it'll be your chance to vote on motions, make changes, and kind of set priorities for the Young Greens over the next year. And we will be uh, unveiling our new committee for the Young Greens. And finally, that is our click to tweet, which I'm going to successfully put in the chat first time. I'm going to do it this time, guys. Believe me, we can do it. Hey, um, so if you click on that one, it will bring up a pre, a pre filled tweet, which you can edit. Um, but saying that you've come to this hustings and it was great and sharing the link to the one tomorrow so they are all in the chat now uh, sorry that wasn't quite as smooth as it could have been but thank you so much for coming everyone um, and for engaging in this process uh, thank you to candidate candidates attendees to tom for hosting and enjoy your friday evening everyone um we'll see you tomorrow thank you. thanks so much folks Bye. That was definitely the best hustings and thanks everyone who organized it as well, thanks, everyone who organized it as well. <laughs> thank thanks you. for coming amelia Thanks for joining us. Cheers, Andrew. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye.